Well, why are we not surprised? First it was the dreaded mobile phone, and now it's uh, Wi-Fi with new health fears for the internet generation. So should we really be worried? Well, if you believe the country's best brain surgeon and plenty of cancer researchers, radiation transmitted from Wi-Fi might, just might, be dangerous. Here's Maggie Palmer. It's invisible and incredibly powerful. It allows us to be online all the time. Wi-Fi internet operates by emitting electromagnetic radiation, the same thing mobile phones release. Last year, a study found using a mobile could increase the risk of cancer. So, could Wi-Fi also be harming our health? I personally feel like there is a relationship between the two, i.e. exposure to electromagnetic magnetic radiation and, uh, and brain cancer. Especially for our children who are the heaviest users of a lot of technology. In effect, what they are is lab rats. The concern is worldwide. Some schools in the UK and France have forbidden wireless internet after parents raised concerns. Acclaimed neurosurgeon Charlie Teo fears there's a connection between exposure to wireless technologies and illness. There's this latency between exposure and, uh, and the genesis of a brain, of a brain tumour. There's an argument that because Wi-Fi technology emits a lower level of radiation than a mobile, there's nothing to worry about. I'm in the middle of the Melbourne CBD right now and if I search for Wi-Fi on my laptop, there are 12 different connections available. And unlike a mobile that we only use occasionally, we're being exposed to this radiation all the time. Don Maisha's PhD looks at electromagnetic radiation and standards. He worries about the impact of long-term exposure. And in relation to Wi-Fi, there is a body of science which says, for some people, this may be a health risk. George Parker is walking proof of that. He says he physically feels when Wi-Fi internet is activated. It's a burning sensation all over your skin and face, mainly the face and arms and legs, down to the ankle. You get heart palpitation. Professor Bruce Armstrong is an expert in cancer causes. He's not convinced Wi-Fi poses a risk, but he does concede the long-term ramifications of widespread usage are unknown. I cannot conclusively say that there is no link. And it's for that reason that prudence can be the right action to take. Measures like moving the wireless router as far away from people as possible can help, as well as turning off Wi-Fi when it's not needed. That there has been this massive increase in human exposure to a particular environmental agent, radio frequency, energy, and history tells us that sometimes, perhaps even quite often, those big increases ultimately turned out to have a downside in terms of harmful health effects. The start of a new school year, and for some parents in Collingwood, that means the worrying begins all over again. This is the site of a perplexing coincidence or a disturbing connection. A school where a dozen students began to develop headaches, nausea, rashes, and racing hearts after the school went completely wireless. I felt fun last year, but this year I feel weird, and I get a lot of headaches. Jeremiah Churchley is one of those kids. We met him this past summer when school was out. My heart that beats really fast, and my head starts hurting, and it bugs me a lot. And I get really thirsty. All at the same time? So can you describe what it feels like when all this is happening to you? Well, I start feeling very nervous when it all starts happening, especially with my heart. I always think I'm going to die because it's beating so fast. I think I'm going to have a heart attack, but I don't. Doctors put Jeremiah on a heart monitor for a few days, but couldn't figure out what was causing his heart to suddenly race. The symptoms would disappear when Jeremiah was home and start again at school. One day, his mother Betty was with him when he pulled out his laptop in the classroom. And he grabbed my hand. He put my hand on his heart. And his heart was beating so fast. And it was hard. And you could actually see it beating through the sweater. How do you know it's Wi-Fi? That's a good question, and it's something that the school board and Health Canada needs to look into. I've had him to the hospital. They don't know what's wrong with him. Um, I keep mentioning, is it possible to Wi-Fi at the school, but a couple of doctors never even heard of it. For months, Churchley has been looking for answers, and she's not alone. I get a phone call that he's collapsed again. 
I just lost. About 30 parents in this central Ontario area also believe their children got sick after Wi-Fi was installed in their schools. Wi-Fi in schools is a bad idea. On this night, they've invited a controversial professor from Trent University to speak to the community. Magda Havis is Canada's leading voice against Wi-Fi. She's researched radiation effects on health for nearly 20 years and says about 3% of the population is sensitive to radiation. I think that the inventors of radar never dreamed that we would have the same frequencies inside classrooms exposing children to them. Havis says Wi-Fi routers are like mini cell phone towers and based on what some studies on cell phone tower exposure and cell phone use have found, she says Wi-Fi can be dangerous too. The closest we can get are cell phones and cell phone towers, very similar frequencies, and we're finding it's making people sick. Wi-Fi works through the transmission of radio waves between a router and a small transmitter in a computer. The radiation signals are about 50 times weaker than a cell phone. But critics say a child in a school that is completely wireless is spending the day under a Wi-Fi smog, constantly exposed to radiation signals from many transmitters from the hours of 9 to 3 every day. In fact, in these parts, there's no getting away from Wi-Fi in classrooms. In the last two years, the wireless technology has been installed in more than 100 schools in the area. We got a tour of Mountain View after students had gone home for the summer. Eight routers are in place here. There's even one in the kindergarten class. Parents like Churchley have offered to pay to have the school hardwired and say they aren't asking for much more. Getting somebody, a professional, in to investigate. Either turn off the Wi-Fi, all of them, for a few months and see how the kids act. The board did consult with a lot of experts after parents raised concerns provincial health authorities, a radiation scientist, and checked in with the final authority on the issue, Health Canada. All say Wi-Fi is perfectly safe. Health Canada sets the rules on how much exposure is too much in Safety Code 6. But Health Canada's safety limits have come under fire because they're based on whether radiation signals have a thermal effect. That is, whether they heat tissues in your body and pose a health risk. Wi-Fi signals are called non-thermal because they aren't strong enough to have a heating effect. But critics say there is plenty of proof they can still be dangerous. When you look at research done elsewhere, what they're finding is there, there's absolutely no heating possible, and yet you're having these reactions. The blood starts clotting, uh, people um, can't sleep at night, they develop headaches, and this is well, well below uh, the thermal guidelines. And I think it's, and so far, our government has basically said, well, that can't be, there must be something wrong with the way they did the studies, but you can't start faulting thousands and thousands of studies. The thousands of studies the Wi-Fi skeptics point to are in what's called the Bioinitiative Report. The studies in it link low-level radiation exposure to a spectrum of health risks, from insomnia and reproductive damage to cancer. But even a 1999 report commissioned by Health Canada could not rule out the possibility of adverse health effects of non-thermal radiation and called for more research, especially among children. No conclusive evidence and still a raging debate. Despite decades of research, yes, science is not absolute, but there's a big piece of information missing that helps explain why. Despite the thousands of studies both sides draw on, there's not one on Wi-Fi that focuses specifically on children. We need to be concerned about susceptible populations. But it does concern many experts, including one of the top scientists Health Canada consults with regularly. Daniel Kruski is the director of the McLaughlin Center for Population Health Risk Assessment. He says the weight of evidence does suggest Wi-Fi is not harmful, but says children could be more vulnerable to prolonged exposure because they're still developing. And he wants to know more. Although there have been a large number of studies focusing on radio frequency fields, everyone really is identifying children as an area where we do actually need more data. And it's that gap that continues to fuel fears. This is the first time anyone said, please tell us. Collingwood parents managed to make their case to Ontario health officials last month. The ministry is now reviewing the science behind Wi-Fi. And concerns have been raised in other parts of the country too. If there's a question mark, you wouldn't cross the street. This summer, concerned parents and international experts drew hundreds from Toronto to Vancouver to lectures on Wi-Fi risks 
and Lakehead University already bans Wi-Fi on its campuses. In Collingwood, another school year has started and still no one can answer the question. Are the sick kids here a Wi-Fi warning signal or is something else going on? Kruski says it's time a top authority like Health Canada investigates. I'd probably want to, number one, uh, get some accurate measures of the level of exposure. When, when the public is concerned, it's the responsibility of regulatory agencies to also be concerned and, and to look into those issues and, and help resolve them. And see, that's rivers, right? Angela Klein is homeschooling her daughter. Last year, she was in grade two at St. Vincent Euphasia Elementary in Meaford. We love our school, but my daughter just can't go there right now. The reason? Wi-Fi. Klein was chair of the parent council, but quit and pulled her daughter out in June after doing her own homework on the effects of Wi-Fi. Damage to the blood-brain barrier, calcium flux. Um, I, there is a link to, to diabetes, um, behavioral changes, uh, cancer. European studies have convinced her that Wi-Fi, even at a low level, is hazardous. Unfortunately, kids are going to be exposed for a number of years, and, and kids are going to get sick, and there's nothing I can do about it. But I can protect my own child. It's everyday long-term low-dose level that some people are concerned about. Recent studies, including one from Canada, say laptops in Wi-Fi mode sitting on a man's lap for an extended period may affect fertility. If your sperm's damaged in four hours from Wi-Fi from a laptop, what is going to happen to the little girls who have eggs in their ovaries and the kids with 20 laptops running Wi-Fi? With the mounting information, which is now on my mind become evidence rather than uh, just information, that it was prudent to have uh, a precautionary principle as our guiding post in this regard. And because of those biological effects, potentially health effects of continuous exposure, even to uh, you know, the low level exposure that you get with, with Wi-Fi. As a parent, I wonder, how does it compare to a cell phone tower, for example? You know, we've read these studies that show that living within three or four hundred meters of a cell phone tower can increase your chance of all kinds of ailments, headaches, dizziness, um, even cancer and leukemia. What if you measured that? And then what about at our school? Could you measure what the microwaves are at our school where the kids are sitting every day? Even if you measured outside of the windows, right where the kids are sitting in the kindergarten class, could you detect microwaves? My name is Gigi, Mountain View parents have two kids at Mountain View. One is in grade six, one is SK. My concerns are Georgie used to complain of headaches while in school. So then I decided, okay, take the next step go to the doctor. So we went and saw the doctor. She interviewed Georgia and asked, you know, if these headaches occurred while in school, at home, and the outcome was they were only occurring, occurring while she was at school. They weren't occurring on the weekends, and now being in a portable, nothing, no headaches. About two years ago, my son started getting some strange sensations, and it was usually at night time. It would last about 10 or 15 minutes. I had, like, my eyes everything looked big and when my mom talked in bed everything sounded like really really loud his bedroom was right over where we kept our computer i realized later but he would get really strange sensations at bedtime and he would call it the weird brain thing he would describe it as uh, the windows and doors were changing shape and my voice was getting louder and softer so his perceptions were quite distorted and i was worried and i suspected it was the computer one day i just i called the phone company and i just said i wanted to switch to cable and it was it was uh, just a matter of changing the modem he's never had that weird brain thing again ever the computer was right under me so um it was pretty obvious